with so much focus on who the president should choose. Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign says it's also about the main issues this justice will face. Voting rights, abortion, and civil rights top that list. This justice will not just fill a liberal void on the court left behind by Breyer. They will join a right-leaning Roberts court, a court with a record of siding with big money and corporations, not the people most affected by the decisions those corporations make, namely poor people and those of color. As Reverend Barber points out, many who support corporations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce tend to oppose expanding voting rights, civil rights, health care for all, and increasing wages, policies that would benefit 140 million poor and low-income people living in this country. In 2020, data from the Constitutional Accountability Center found the court siding with the Chamber of Commerce nearly 70% of the time in cases where the Chamber filed an amicus brief. In short, the push now, at least for Reverend Barber, is for the president to pick a justice, a black woman, whose lived experience will drive decisions that represent and help people not corporations. Reverend Barber joins me now. As mentioned, he is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and president of Repairs of the Breach. Reverend, always good to see you. Make the case for me that this needs to be a main consideration. Well, Alicia, right now, we are making our way to Washington, D.C. for the mass Poor People's Low-Wage Workers Assembly Mall March on Washington to the polls June 18th. And we're going to make sure the world and the country knows you can't ignore anymore 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country. Now, our studies show that 45 percent of the electorate in battleground states where the difference was three, just three percent, are poor and low-wealth people. The Supreme Court can determine who has power in this country. That's why we're watching this very carefully. The Supreme Court can gut, like it did the Voting Rights Act in 2013 and basically unleash voter suppression, as it has since 2013. Or the Supreme Court can pass rulings that benefit corporations and give corporations more power to not only uh, influence the election with more money than poor and low people have, but also to give corporations more power to block things like living wages. And so we are watching this very carefully. You know, we remember when um, Ms. Barrett was put on the court a lot of people didn't take a look at it. She sided with corporations 76 percent of the time when she was in the Seventh Circuit. A lot of times Republicans say they're, they're looking for abortion and prayer in the school but, and, and against gay people. But, but look deeper. Almost all of the appointments of Republican presidents are those that side with corporations against poor and low-wage workers in this country. Reverend, looking through the lens that you are providing, we're going to hear a lot about all of these potential nominees in the coming days, both their judicial records and their personal stories. Why is the lived experience so important? Well, the lived experience and the judicial experience. You know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of people saying that this is an affirmative action pick. I mean, when Reagan said he was going to pick a woman, nobody said, they didn't say that. When Trump said he was going to pick a woman, President Biden should just do it. He said he was going to do it. And this is not about being qualified. Black women have been qualified since Constance Baker and Pauli Murray and, and my dear friend Anita Earls and, and Cheryl Eiffel. I mean, it could go down the list. This is about the affirmative inaction of, of, of the picks of presidents that to never put a black woman <clears throat> on the court. But as Thurgood Marshall said, yes, black must be considered, but also judicial philosophy. Because the question is, the person you want is a black woman with a judicial philosophy proven in their decision that they are serious about the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law, the 15th Amendment, the voting rights pieces, that they are serious about those laws and our Constitution that protect the people against the domination of a, uh, of a, of a regressive majority or the domination of money and greed in this, in this country. So lived experience and judicial experience is so critical. Should we be the president do it? Yes, do it. Time. Been past time. But as Thurgood Marshall and Pauli Murphy said, we have to make sure we look not only at skin color and, 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 and gender, because skin color and gender don't necessarily transfer into a kind of judicial philosophy that lifts up all people. And are those black women out there more than we can count? So yes, do it, do it now, and let's place somebody on the court that cares about all people judicially and personally. Reverend, I want you to take a listen to Maine Senator Susan Collins earlier today talking about Biden's promise to nominate a black woman. Take a listen. 
I would welcome the appointment of a black female to the court. I believe that diversity benefits the Supreme Court, but the way that the president has handled this nomination has been clumsy at best. It adds to the further perception that the court is a political institution like Congress when it is not supposed to be. Reverend, you've already debunked that claim about this being clumsy and somehow political, given that Ronald Reagan made a similar promise, Donald Trump made a similar promise. I'm not going to ask you to debunk that again, but I do <laughs> wonder what you think, what it is that Republicans are actually saying, what their actual resistance oh. is. Well, it's clear over the years. I mean, you know, first of all, we've had, we've never had a black woman history of the court. So this is absolutely ridiculous. And Senator Collins, all due respect, to her needs to go somewhere and sit down and hush her mouth. Uh, you know, she's talking about diversity. She doesn't can't vote for voting rights. She's talking about diversity. Uh, she doesn't support living wages. So she's not really being, being honest here. And to suggest the president has fumbled this. Listen, the, the bottom line is, <clears throat> It's time for the court to represent all Americans. It sound what Republicans want is a black person that will vote their way. So they like a Clarence Thomas, but they couldn't stand, for instance, a Shirley Eiffel or an Anita Earls. And they want justices that will be black, but then will turn around and vote against the interest, the constitutional right, the constitutional interest of black people. And not just black people, black people, brown people, and white people. That's why I think we have to also add this, this lens of the economics. Because a lot of people will holler diversity, but they mean the diversity that has that, that where you have differences but no change. No, they don't want to see the, the kind of change that needs to happen from a justice standpoint. So, And there is a fear. There is a fear of having a court that is going to take seriously, uh, as I said, the 14th Amendment, take seriously the 15th Amendment, take seriously equal protection under the law, take seriously the First Amendment. So Senator Collins, her own record uh, makes what she just said uh, ridiculous. Uh, now, lastly, but what I also say to the Biden administration, is you cannot do this pick of a black woman and then stop fighting on voting rights and stop fighting on Build Back Better and stop fighting on child tax credits and stop fighting on living wages because all of those things also impact the lives of poor, low wealth black people, brown people, and white people. So this is a pick, get it done, do it, but keep the fight going because we need the courts and we need the legislative policies. It's both and, it's not either or. Reverend, I only got a minute, but I got to make sure I get this in because you tweeted last week that over 200 religious leaders, including yourself, have called on the NFL to remove the 2023 Super Bowl from Arizona because of the state's record on voting laws and its attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Tell me more. If you're going to remove the Super Bowl because the state wouldn't honor the birthday of Dr. King, then you ought to remove it when the senators are not honoring the dream and the policies of Dr. King. Dr. King gave his life, gave his life, and so did many others fighting for voting rights. The senator in Arizona is diametrically opposed to democracy, to America, not just for black people. The, the, the fact that they have blocked voting, uh, passing laws that would deal with voter suppression could hurt 55 million Americans, not just black people, from having access to the polls that they had in 2020. There should be a price to pay for that. Move that Super Bowl. Faithfully to the Senate, it's the moral thing to do. We've got plenty of stadiums and send a statement that you're not going to fund a state where a senator is diametrically opposed to the 15th Amendment. By the way, uh, Alicia, the ratification of the 15th Amendment, the 152nd anniversary, is this coming Thursday, February the 3rd. 152 years ago, we said no one has the right to abridge, deny, or abridge the right to vote. And 152 years later, Senators like uh, the one in Arizona are engaged in abridging the right to vote. And there needs to be clear statements from everybody, the pulpit to the professional football. Everybody needs to be speaking out against this. I appreciate that you don't even need to say her name. Reverend Barber, thank you so much for your time.